It's the 1980s, a time when the power of Satan allowed mere college students to achieve the impossible, like owning their own homes. Young Jonathan Graves has moved into his dead father's mansion. Dad was an accomplished Grand Wizard in the fairly more pleasant band of robed evildoers, the Satanists. Unfortunately, he died before he could invite Lucifer to roam the earth. Now, his dark will emanates from a grave on the house's property, influencing Jonathan to sweep, dust, and seek out the secrets of magical dominance of demons. Following the instructions in his father's tombs and grimoires, Jonathan becomes an adept at magic, much to the chagrin and worry of his girlfriend. Having summoned a group of bestial familiars, the ghoulies, and two stunted troll familiars to help him wrangle the beast, Jonathan takes on one final step into the beyond by sacrificing his friends at a dinner party. He also unwittingly resurrects dear old dad, who wanders from his grave and into final battle with Jonathan over the right to be master of the ghoulies. The greater magician will sacrifice the lesser, summoning Lucifer to Earth. Which warlock will win? For a hot minute in the 1980s, moviegoers had to watch where they stepped lest they risk tripping over something small, furry, and absolutely evil. Miniature monsters in alien movies were all the rage. One would think these little furry monsters were surely all kids' film romps, and the movie certainly banked on that idea on a surface level to draw in crowds, and then trapped viewers into a surprising, nasty, dark world of chaos and vicious, chomping horror. We had the deceptively cute gremlins, which were the most family-friendly, until after midnight. Then there were the critters, alien beasts that rolled around as comical furry balls, talked trash, and made for a fun action-adventure sci-fi movie. And then there was 1985's Ghoulies. We've got to talk about these little guys. Despite having probably the cutesiest name of the mini-monster boom, these demons are the nastiest of the nasty, both in origin, in terms of their respective movie's tone, and by their very appearance. The ghoulies are never nice like a mogwai could be at times, and they were, had more variety than your crate from critters. These are literally demons from hell that exist to do nothing but be disgusting and murder people. I love the sheer amount of variety in the ghoulies. They're really iconic now amongst the VHS generation of horror goers. A lot of us probably remember seeing the covers for the ghoulies VHS movies with the monsters sticking out of the toilet. That cover, with the promise that there was a monster inside the toilet waiting to bite me, was seared into my brain, and consequently it made going to the bathroom as a child very difficult. So among the ghoulies we had the little bald green fishman, something that looks like a run-over wombat, the amazing jacked cat-like ghoulie that I wanted to pet for some weird reason, the flying freak, which you see rarely more rare than the others, each beast has great animatronic presence. They're literally the first thing you see when the movie starts. It's a great attention to detail. They're able to appear creepy, menacing, and yet also comedic, which kind of makes them scarier somehow. It's a true feat for puppetry in any case. Speaking of the intro, I love when the ghoulie covers its face. It's a funny reaction, and it lets you know that this is a gruesome movie, but it's not an unrelenting slog of gore and misery. Ghoulies is like a haunted house ride in a carnival. Scary, but for... Well, you know what? We'll speak more on ghoulies and carnivals later. As great as the titular monsters are, Ghoulies goes even further and hosts a whole menagerie of evil beings that keep the movie interesting, never relying on just the ghoulies to deliver the weird and the wild. There's this grave zombie lich magician that pops out of the grave, and it looks a lot like Return of the Living Dead. Then there's the unexplained but slick creepy puppet monster that seems to exist somehow outside of any summoning rituals. It's in that room before they do any sort of magic that I could see, so you don't really know why it's there. It's definitely a ripoff of Poltergeist, but it works. Even if it is the weakest and most inexplicable part of a movie that features midgets levitating cups with their minds, it's still the weakest part. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. It looks cool though, I guess that's all that matters. Speaking of those two little people, I also dug the costumes and wardrobe in the movie, which have an incredible variety. The two familiars look really memorable, the satanic cult's robes are very on point, and the humans even have distinct styles that are oh so 80s, distinct and bold. Not only can you tell characters apart, you can tell what archetype each character is by their clothes, a key for horror movies like these to open subtle doors to better places. That said, the acting must also be mentioned here. 
Take Malcolm Graves, who is so overwrought and corny in his bad guy dialogue as the head Satanist wizard that you would expect this movie to play at 8 a.m. on a Saturday somewhere. Where are your gods now? They too are mine. Yet his delivery of hocus pocus, the devil is my focus type lines, his accent, his eyes, all really cast an enjoyable spell of evil here, making for a really good villain. This is one of those movies that flows because of the actor's ability to carry the film. I wasn't taken out of the movie by anything like wooden dialogue. Could you do a good job acting seriously horrified while someone gets eaten by a fish baby? The movie could never work without these actors, I think. They all do their part and deliver the movie with a lighthearted seriousness that is exactly what it needs to be, as this is a movie about summoning Satan with tiny midgets and even tinier little devil puppets. It could be completely silly, but it works. I suspect the writing also helped our actors out. Whether it's Satanistic lingo that sounds like someone invoking a model's name, or stoners making fun of their situation with Scooby-Doo and Three Stooges references, Ghoulies really demonstrates a wide range and type of dialogue, the scary and the silly. For some reason, the line I remember most out of this movie from the very first time I saw it is, Hey dude, don't, don't bogart, bogart that, that joint. joint. And then there's, the weirdo of the movie. He's just this weird looking guy who then does this. You don't love me. You just had. Yeah, I can't talk to you, man. Which is even weirder somehow. I always wonder if the actor improvised this, the voice, the lines, or if it was all part of the plan from the go with the script. It would be fun to know. Speaking of little stuff like that, not just the little beasts, there are tons of small touches in the movie which really creep me out. Like, who thought to have all these dead bodies crawl like worms down to the basement when they're summoned? It's as brilliant as it is bizarre. Also of note is the soundtrack, which romps around with humorous riffs before taking viewers down into some more standard dark basements of horror. Still, it's as varied as the ghoulies are themselves as varied as this movie is in its tones of both horror and comedy. Taking all of this in, you really have to consider Ghoulies a very achieved horror movie. Gross, balding, dripping in slime and magical powers, Ghoulies packs a big punch with its short runtime, scurrying pace, and surprising satanic twist. Keep an eye out for that dude from Eraserhead, by the way. I won't spoil it because you probably won't recognize him, but he's there, lurking. I give Ghoulies five satanic Cracker Jack prizes out of five. Ghoulies satisfies my interest in satanic intrigue. It has great animatronics, and its comedic chops are as sharp as that little bastard's teeth that I know is still waiting in my toilet, even to this day. All of these things are designed to frighten a monkey.